Hi! In today's video, we're diving into the fundamentals of concurrency in Swift 6.2. So you can start migrating your projects and take advantage of concurrency safe code. By the end, you'll understand how to read and fix concurrency-related compiler errors by choosing the right tool for the job. Swift 6.2 refines many concurrency APIs and behaviors, making this the perfect time to finally learn it, especially if you've been putting it off. Quick note, everything I cover applies to Swift 6.2 and later, since concurrency features can behave differently depending on the compiler versions and language modes or compiler frags. If you're new here, I'm Felipe, an iOS developer with 10 years of experience based in Norway. Over the past couple months, I've been diving deep into concurrency. Books, documentations, real-world examples. And my goal is to give you an overview of the fundamental concurrency concepts. So let's start with one key question. What does Swift concurrency solve? The main objective of Swift concurrency is to avoid data races at compile time. Basically, avoid sharing an unsafe mutable state. Let's break that down. First, what's a data race? In this code, there are two tasks that run in parallel and modify the same variable. So what's the result of its execution? Hard to say. It will be non-deterministic because the result variable is being modified in different threads at the same time. That's unsafe share mutable state. Okay, so we want to avoid that, but why is it important to be at compile time? Before concurrency in Swift, to avoid the races, we would need tools like locks and semaphores, where it depends on developers to ensure the right concurrency behavior. But this requires tons of work, testing, and after all that, there can still be bugs. Then it's better to delegate this to the compiler and avoid those problems altogether. Similarly, how optionals help us write safer code. How can Swift ensure that no data races can occur at compile time? Swift uses a mechanism called data isolation. It's a form of synchronization, conceptually similar to a lock. But unlike a lock, the protection data isolation provides happens at compile time. It uses the fine isolation domains to avoid mutually exclusive access to mutable state. That isolation can be static or dynamic. Dynamic applies when we deal with Objective-C compatibility, but for Swift, the common case is to use static data isolation, which I will focus on, and it's made possible by isolation domains. Isolation domains define a safe concurrency boundary where a given variable, for example, mutable state number one, can only be accessed once at a time within the isolation domain. And to cross isolation domains, we cannot do it synchronously. We need to use async await. There are three main isolation domains. One, non-isolated, which is the default domain, and it will run the code on the thread of the caller. It doesn't offer mutable state protection, so the compiler will complain if you attempt to define non-isolated shared mutable state. Two, global actor. As a known example, the main actor. It acts as a sort of ticket inspector. So types in this global actor domain can interact synchronously with other members of the same group. Three, actors. They'll allow us to define bubbles of isolation. As a conceptual example of these domains, here we have a main actor global actor, two concrete actors and the non-isolated context. Inside those domains, we have types defined into them and their mutable state. Within the same domain, types can access other types synchronously. To cross boundaries, then we need async await. When it comes to isolation domains, where does my code run? Threads. When we want to specify where our code runs, we cannot annotate our code with main actor to run on the main thread which is where we want to run UI-related code. Swift UI itself runs on the main thread. Add concurrent. With this annotation, a task or a function will run on some background thread. The system will decide on which concrete thread, and it's great to offload expensive operations that could block your UI. The problem of working with multiple threads is that it can lead to data races. We can avoid the issue by running everything on the main thread. Easy. That's true, and that's exactly what Xcode 26 defaults approach for new projects is. By default, every type on the new app will be isolated to the main actor. The problem, though, is that we could be doing an expensive operation and we could block the main thread, making our UI glitchy. When that happens, then we might want to introduce concurrency. When it comes to concurrency, if we don't have shared mutable state, we don't have any editors at all. Easy. But for most apps, we will have some shared mutable state. We know that isolation domains protect the state. The next question is, 
How to cross between isolation domains. For value types, we could ensure that they conform to Sendable. What is Sendable? It's an empty protocol that the compiler uses to check that we don't have shared mutable state within the type. Sendable types can safely be sent as copies to other isolation boundaries. In that sense, they are particularly useful for structs and enums with value type semantics. You can make a class sendable, but it's not something that you would normally want to do. But then, what about reference types? Well, actor's properties are safe to send across isolation boundaries, do that the actor itself protects the state. That makes actors implicitly sendable. For classes, we can use global actor isolation, like main actor. It protects the access to the state of the class. Annotating classes with a global actor will also make them implicitly sendable. For closures, we could use sendable to make sure that they only capture sendable state, so the closure is safe to run on any thread. Or we can use admin actor when you would primarily access UI properties. Let's put the concepts into practice. Let's see an example on how to understand error messages. To the left, I have a non-isolated class called data container. It has a property called messages, which is an array of a string. On the right side, we can see a view model that is an observable object that is annotated with the main actor. One property that is interesting is the constant data container of type data container. If we were to attempt to compile this code, we would get an error message that says something like non sendable type data container of property data container cannot exit main actor isolated context. Uh, okay. This error is not that easy to understand, but let's zoom in on the error a bit. The first thing that we can do is try to split the error in different parts. The first part, non sendable type data container. For that type, we need to think about what's the isolation domain of data container. For the declaration before, we say that the class data container is non-isolated, that's the isolation domain, and something that is also relevant is that this class doesn't conform to sendable. So it's a non-isolated, non-sendable class. Okay, that's what we know about data container. What about the property? What's the isolation domain of the property data container? Then in the code, we can see that the data container property is annotated with the main actor. That's the isolation domain of the variable, main actor. And the last part of the error says cannot exit main actor isolated context. Well, we're running on a task. In which isolation domain is the task running on? So if we see here, the type is annotated with main actor, but then the function print messages concurrently is annotated with add concurrent. The task due to isolation domain inheritance is, is also concurrent, meaning the context is concurrent. Okay, now we sort of broke down the error a bit, and the problem is that we're trying to access a data container variable that lives in the main actor from a concurrent thread, and the type of data container is not sendable. Okay, how do we solve this? Well, we have several options. One would be to make data container sendable. We don't really want to make class types sendable. It's too cumbersome, and we would need an slug. So it's not the right solution in this case we can mark data container as main actor. This can work, it will trigger other errors, but this class was marked as non-isolated on purpose. So not the right solution for this case. We can make the task run on the main actor. Since we are interacting with a at main actor variable, this makes the most sense in this case. So this is a solution that we will choose. Now when we annotate the task with main actor, the error disappears. Sadly, a new error appears, sending person risk causing data races. If you look at the definition of person, we can see that it's sendable. So it should be safe to move across isolation boundaries. Huh? Person is indeed sendable, but we're accessing mutable state from another thread. We should capture the value if you want to access it in the closure. So we get a copy of that person inside the task. Once we add person to the capture list, the error disappears and the code compiles. It's a simple example but illustrates how we reason about isolation and sendability to choose the right tool for the job. Summary. These are the basic building blocks of Swix 6.2 concurrency, which is all about avoiding data races at compile time. This is achieved with data isolation through isolation domains, which can be non-isolated, actor isolated, or global actor isolated. To cross isolation domains safely, we need sendability which can be explicit with the sendable protocol 
or implicit through global actor or actor isolation. Those mechanisms help us to safely take advantage of threads with either at main actor annotation for the main thread or with the at concurrent annotation which will be run in the background thread pool. Concurrency is a complex topic. I watched and rewatched the session embracing Swift concurrency from this year's .dc to digest all the concepts. That session is the perfect follow-up for this video. I hope you got a better foot to understand and use concurrency features in Swift. If you have any questions, leave a comment and I will answer. In the next video, I will take these concepts and apply them to migrating an app to 6.6.2. Subscribe not to miss it. If you like this video, you can watch next my video how to modularize an iOS app with SPM packages, on which I split an app into SPM packages, which then can be migrated module by module to Swift 6.2. Until the next one.